<laughs> I'd like to welcome you all today to this, this, uh, this meeting. Four Street Development Housing Authority. We're making our city more inviting than ever. Four Street Development Housing Authority, PRHA Board of Commissioners. Meetings are held on the third Thursday of each month at 5 p.m. All meetings are conducted at PRHA's main office at 3116 <clears throat> South Street, Force Virginia 23707, unless otherwise noted. All members of the public are welcome to attend. All righty, Madam Secretary, roll call. Please. All right, Commissioner Jiggins. Present. Commissioner Lalonde. Yes, sir. Commissioner Morgan. Here. Commissioner Roberts. Here. Commissioner Washington. Vice Chair Chapman. Here. And Chair Smith. Here. We do have a quorum. Awesome. Alrighty. First order of business, we have our annual 2019-2020 and five-year 2016-2020 HC plan. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. So most of you all have been here before with us to just aim the plan process. Um, this is just due to this, but um, we're going to discuss the agency plan approval process. And so as you know, this is required for all agencies and ministries of housing choice voucher program and public housing program. And basically, it's a guide to, um, for programs and policies. And it's a source of information for program participants, HUD, and the public. So we have two parts to this, a five-year plan and an annual plan. The five-year plan is submitted every fifth year and is <coughs> approved now from HUD from 2016 to 2020. And it's a long-range goal for meeting the needs of low-income people. On the second part, <coughs> the second part is the annual plan and strategies for address addressing upcoming needs in the year 2019-2020. So, included in the HDB um, agency plan and the public housing emissions and continual occupancy plan, we have um, policies and procedures that relates to. Section 8 and the uh, Public Housing Administration Plan. So, let's talk about the process. So, we have to change the plan every year. We look at it, see what changes we need to make. We also have to advertise in the pilot, and we also have to put notices up in the um, main offices and the properties. Public comment is for 45 days, and we also have to have a meeting with the RAD board. And the public meeting today or hearing is scheduled for today. So only new activities that we have taking place this fiscal year is, of course, the demolition of Lincoln, Lincoln Park. Um, we run a project-based voucher those units, and then we're going to apply for a safety and security grant. So that's part of the plan for the 2019 year as well. So Dolores, Ms. Adams, is going to discuss the procurement changes, followed by who next, I think, Val Jenkins, who's going to discuss housing, and Carol will discuss Section 8. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I have the easy part. <laughs> um, as far as our procurement plan, there has been um, very few changes. However, we have a great change. HUD has agreed to um, some guidance that was sent out last year from the, um, the federal government implemented this plan, this, these changes in procurement thresholds last year. However, HUD did not allow housing authorities to do that. We received notification back in March that HUD said, okay, you can follow this guidance. So right now, our micro-purchase threshold that has been $3,000, and it's been that way for several years now, has been increased to 5000 according to HUD. And, um, and then they also increased the small purchase threshold to $250,000. But because we are governed by the most stringent of the state or the federal government, we have to stick with the state micro purchase. I mean, the state small purchase threshold, which is $100,000. Hmm. So if the state changes theirs, then we can change ours up to the whole HUD threshold. So we changed everywhere um, in the procurement policy that the micro purchase threshold was 3000 to 5000 that's, that was the major change. The second change was a housekeeping change. We have a, we, every time we do a procurement action, we have to do a cost, an independent cost estimate so that we can, uh, we know what we expect the um, procurement to, um, item, procured item 
good of service to cost. And it is just that an estimate. Sometimes um, it's off, but it is just an estimate. We just have to have a ballpark figure. <clears throat> and previously, the, the director of um, budget was signed <clears throat> that form, but we no longer have that position. So now it's signed by our director of finance. So those were the only two changes that we made to the procurement policy. Good evening. Good evening. We really don't have a lot of changes. We just did a lot of housekeeping. So under Chapter 3, which is eligibility, we edited the policy to allow the PHA to verify the living need, a living aid if necessary with professional and for continued approval. The family may be required to submit a new written request. I can't see on this side at least. I know it's difficult to yeah. look at. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, Chapter 4, Occupancy Standards and Unit Offer. We added what was uh, determined proof of residency, so we defined that, mm -hmm. meaning that we asked the uh, applicants to bring in uh, postmarked mail within 60 days of their application from the interview process, or some type of forwarding document from the U.S. Post Office and driver's license. We added the VAWA preference for selection uh, method. VAWA, Violence Against Women Act. You'll hear us say that. I know Commissioner Jiggins always say we have a lot of Afro men, so that's what that is. <laughs> so with the VAWA, the PHA will offer a preference to families that include victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assaults, or stalking who is seeking an emergency transfer under VAWA from the PHA's public housing program or other covered housing programs operated by the PHA. Okay, Chapter 5, Occupancy Standards and Unit Offers. We added to the policy that the PHA will deny a family permission to make an elective move during the family's initial lease term. Uh, you want to tell Meaning, me that? Yeah, explain Meaning so when you first move in, you have a year's lease. So what happens, say if you got housed today in Dale, and your name came up on Seaboard, say in May, then they would want to move instead of completing a 12 month lease. But keep in mind that they will not lose their place on our oh, they won't, right, Correct. They won't lose their place on our wait list, but we just won't allow them to transfer that way. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they have to serve out their initial, initial lease. lease. Mm -hmm. Re-examination. Streamlined annual re-exams. Edit the policy to allow the PHA to determine when streamlined re-examinations can be applied. Otherwise, full annual re-exams will be applied. And we also added <coughs> that public housing will only complete streamlined annual re-exams if feasible. So basically, what that streamlined is if you want a fixed income, pension, Social Security, you would still the following year have to be certified, but we just wouldn't have to get the verifications again. But because the majority of our properties are tax credit, we can't do it that way. So the only property that would actually be feasible for would be Swanson. And Chapter 10, Pets. Edited the policy not to allow the PHA to require pet owners to obtain or carry liability insurance and not to require cats to be deployed. Okay. <laughs> now, in that particular chapter, we talked about it uh, during the housing committee meeting this afternoon that uh, there may be some city restrictions that do require that the pet, that the owners have insurance. 
uh, particularly if the, the dog is declared to be a dangerous dog. So between the Humane Society and the city, it is going to require them. So that will, you know, so we'll have to follow what the city has and the city department has. So, so is that included in that chapter? Well, in, in our would, policy, it, in our, okay. It, it, yeah. In our policy, it does state that they have to have license. Mm -hmm. So in order to get licensed, you know it has to go through the city. So once they try to go get a, a license for that animal, they, that's when the city will tell them that they have to follow those procedures. I have a question. It's a little further back. Yes, ma'am. The live-in aid mm -hmm. is that literally someone? Oh, that yes, ma'am. So say if I was in. an app, uh, applicant or resident, mm -hmm. and I became disabled, and I needed someone there twenty-four hours around the clock with me, that's considered a live-in aid. But we need to get proof from a, a professional mm -hmm. stating that this person does qualify <coughs> or need a live-in aid there with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter 13, lease termination, other authorized reasons for termination. We edited the policy to allow the PHA the option to terminate the tendencies of certain over-income families. So with that, the income of the families can exceed 120% of the AMI. If they do, it's a process. The first six months we normally monitor, then we go to that year. After the second year, if they still over that 120% uh, percent AMI, we can terminate their lease if we have to. Mm. And I know the Housing Choice Voucher have been doing that for a long time. Mm. Mm. All right, Chapter 14, Grievances and Appeals. We edit the policy not to allow PHA to offer grievance hearings for lease terminations involving criminal activity that resulted in felony convictions of a household member. And you can see what's listed there. <laughs> Any criminal activity that threatens the health or safety or right to peaceful enjoyment of the premises of the residents or employees of the PHA. Any violent or drug-related criminal activity on or off such premises or a criminal activity that resulted in the felony conviction of a household member. Any question? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you at least allow the convicted person to exhaust all of their appeal rights first before you initiate that? Once they're convicted and we choose to terminate, we can. We won't have a um, hearing. So at that point, if they're already convicted and they've gone through, through the appeal process. Well, see, that's not clear. That's what I'm saying. Oh, but yeah, Are you saying they've convicted. gone through all of their, exhausted all of their appeal rights? Mm -hmm. And then that's where uh, this is implemented, because I think that needs to be clarified to okay, say because that. because what normally happens is, and I know, um, Attorney James, you can step in, sometimes it's continued and continued, another appeal, right. another appeal, another well, appeal. That's still right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, it is. So. That's still right. Okay. Okay. Voucher admin plan for the most part um, we try to mirror both plans try to mirror each other so that we're applying basically the same process so our first change that we have in the section 8 housing choice voucher administrative plan is we've added also the VAWA preference so let's say you have someone who's in public housing that is in a, a, um, a situation where they're being stalked or whatever, maybe they need to get out of the city of Portsmouth. So the only way they could do that with assistance is with a housing choice voucher. So this allows us to issue them a voucher in a situation such as that. And then under chapter six for assets, in our previous plan, uh, we were requesting six bank statements that we would do an average of in order to determine whether what the amount of assets that someone had um, in their bank accounts, et cetera. And we were finding that a lot of our tenants uh, or participants did not have six bank statements. 
So we have reduced it to just using the current statements that they provide to us. Question on that. Yes, ma'am. Why wouldn't they have six bank statements if they've got a checking account? Well, sometimes the bank's going to charge you in order to give you. They don't. They just simply don't keep it. Sometimes some of our participants just don't keep their bank statements. Now I know you and I are probably look at it and say, well, we keep ours, but not everybody does, and so they may not have six bank statements, and they would have to go to the bank to get them. Because a lot of times you're speaking about people that are elderly in this situation. They're not real savvy with the computer. So they're not going to be able to print it off, et cetera, and the bank's going to charge them for yeah. the bank statement. Well, uh, personally, I have not had a functioning printer in probably five years, mm -hmm. but you can always call into your bank and have it faxed to PRHA or whomever, mm -hmm. whatever is requested. That's why I was curious mm -hmm. as to why it was reduced to just one bank statement. Well, the one bank statement will generally give you some idea as to what they've got going on because, and, and nine times out of ten, most of the of our participants that have bank accounts, it's kind of an in and out type thing. The mm -hmm. money goes in, they pay the bills, and they're going to sure. basically end up with the same balance every month they're about. So it, it's really not feasible to put them through it. Hmm. If we have any reason to think that they do have assets, etc., then of course we'll go to greater lengths to help them get that information to us. Okay. But if it's just a general in and out bank account, and you can also sometimes if they have a debit card and so forth, they can kind of get us a printout, you know, with that as well. So we just use whatever information they have because it's generally not worth, you know, going to putting them through the hassle to get it. Yeah, I can see maybe you wanting to retrench it, but to take it from six down to one, mm -hmm. there's no comparison there. I mean, at least from six down to two would have been the feasible way to do it. Well, well, to be honest with you, we never got six anyway, even though we yeah, were asking for six, so mm -hmm. we weren't getting the six. And it really was a hassle and it was a delay for them in order for us to go ahead and process, so that's why we reduced it. The one bank statement actually will give us the information we need. But it doesn't give you any comparative information is what I'm saying. Well... Two will give you Ms. comparative Blake, information. Say, yes. Well, once again, keep remember these are HUD guidelines, yes. mm -hmm. uh -huh. and that's what we're governed by. One is it was will satisfy HUD, and what HUD is saying that if, if the tenant had to go out and and there's a charge, then mm -hmm. the housing authority had to reimburse them for that charge for them to go get those things. But the the one the, the one meet the HUD guideline. Keep in mind. Our plan is to satisfy our HUD guidelines. And HUD guidelines did the knee-jerk reaction of going from six to one. Sure. Well, That's actually, HUD, HUD guidelines just ask us. That that was an internal thing that we had years okay. back. Mm -hmm. okay. So HUD guidelines just ask us to verify. So one would be satisfactory for HUD. The six was something that we had historically that really isn't necessary. Okay. So we were kind of imposing something that... Uh, it wasn't a requirement, but we were just doing it so that we could kind of get an average and we were finding it wasn't worthwhile. So that's why we took it down to one. You so mean, it wasn't we, HUD that took it down to one? No, it wasn't HUD that took it down to one. It was us. We right. took it down to one because HUD's requirement only requires one. Uh -huh. We just have to verify the asset. So by getting the one, you have met that requirement. So what we usually do is ask for the bank statement that was the bank statement that was the active bank statement before you came in for your appointment. So it's not like they've had time to go to the bank, draw their money out, and bring us a, a bank statement that showed zero. Or, or redeem a lotto ticket. Well. <laughs> Tell them hoping for one day, but anyway. Well, you know, you, you know, an asset is not considered an asset unless they actually do put it in the bank. So most, oh, well, that, the mattress people, is where mine will go to. <laughs> Most people that are going to cash in a winning lottery ticket are not going to take it to the bank. <laughs> the chapter number six is applying payment standards, and this is referencing a decrease in payment standards during the contract term. Um, so previously, uh, we had indicated that if the payment standards reduce, the payment standards are based off of HUD published FMRs, fair market rents, and if the payment standards should reduce, this is just giving us um, definitive action on how we would apply a reduced payment standard to the subsidy for a participant. So if it were to reduce, oh, I need to go down, thank you. <laughs> if it were to reduce, then what we would do 
is uh, not reduce it at the upcoming recertification, but the second recertification. Now keep in mind that we also can set our payment standards anywhere from 90 to 110 percent of the HUD FMRs. <coughs> We're nowhere near that at this point. We're just a little over 100. So if, um, if the rental market dictated that, that the fair market rents decrease, we still have room that we can raise up our payment standards mm -hmm. to keep the, the clients from becoming um, in a situation where they're going to not receive assistance. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it, it, they've been decreasing just a slight little bit over the last couple of years, but other than the HUD shutdown, I can't think of anything that seems to have been an issue. So that's just giving the staff direction on how they would process that. The next thing is initial HQS inspections, which is housing quality standard inspections. And these are the inspections that we are required to perform for any rental property that's under the housing choice voucher program. And what we are saying here generally, um, a housing authority our size can take long, more than 15 business days to, to do initial inspections. We haven't run into that problem as of yet, but we are growing. So we're just kind of looking ahead in the event that there, for some reason we could not get an initial inspection done within 15 business days, that we would document the file as to the reason and get it done as quickly as possible. We've not run into that problem either. Just looking ahead. And then uh, utilities underneath that. Uh, we have our, our procedure here is that we require the property owners to have the utility services on in the unit when we come do the initial inspection. The reason for that, it allows us to do a thorough inspection to ensure that the heat works, the air conditioning works, the stove works, the refrigerator works, all the electrical sockets, etc. Um, they can have it transferred over to the tenant's name when the tenant takes occupancy of the unit, but it eliminates us from having to keep going back because obviously if I'm concerned about us being able to get initials done in 15 days, we don't have time to keep running back to inspect the same unit. Mm -hmm. We're going too fast here. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of hard when you sit there and look away. Yeah. <laughs> HUD has added a uh, requirement to the lead-based paint. Previously, any time you had a house that was built prior to 1978 that was going to be occupied by a child under the age of six, they had to comply with the RRP if they had to do any um, repairs, which is the repair and, and the paint procedure. Um, now HUD is requiring any house that is pre-78 that it is maintained in accordance to the lead-based paint procedures in the event that a child should occupy the unit or visit the unit, etc. That's a HUD requirement. Eligible units, we're just kind of making a reference here just to be sure that we have clarity. Uh, for instance, our property that we own in Hamilton has market units in it. Um, even though it's a tax credit property, some of those, those units are available to be rented on the open market. And any unit that's available on the open market can also be uh, used by a, an assisted tenant so they can take their voucher to that same property and utilize their assistance in that unit. Of course, we don't steer them in that direction. We list the properties just like we do anything else that's available and it's housing choice just like the rest of the houses are. Mm. I see you smiling, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, the same thing with us for the streamlined annual re-examinations. Most of our fixed income participants are elderly disabled, uh, and they may have fixed income such as Social Security or pensions, et cetera. But also, most of them are going to have medical expenses and maybe some assets. So they are required to be verified. The only thing the streamline allows you to do is to apply the COLA to um, calculate what their new income is going to be. So we also will only apply the streamline process when it is feasible. Uh, updating the payment standards. Every year around September or October, uh, HUD publishes the new fair market rents. And when they are published, you generally would have three months in order to make those effective within your program. So HUD has now made a definite date that all uh, 
payment standards will become effective January the 1st of every year. So rather than if they published them in September instead of you saying, okay, I'm going to make them effective December, they would all be made effective January 1st. I thought I saw a hand go up. Did you raise your hand, Mr. Bland? No, I did not. <laughs> and then project-based vouchers. This is just defining the process regarding inspections, HQS inspections. Um, inspections are required for our project-based uh, properties before initial occupancy. And should there be a turnover, meaning a family moved out or another family moved in, the units have to meet compliance before we can approve can occupancy. You, uh, can you <coughs> let them know that we don't do our own units. Oh, we don't. That's correct. We contact <coughs> with Norfolk Housing Authority as our independent agency to perform inspections for our properties. Mm -hmm. And we do theirs. We kind of trade off. Okay. So there's no money exchanging hands? No money just... exchanging hands. Okay. And, and let me just, uh, if you allow me to jump in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is a compliment for this PRHA. Um, I know someone who is a property owner, mm -hmm. and they were complimenting you all on the fairness of your inspections. Oh, well, and there were some you. things they had to do. <laughs> but um, they were just saying that they uh, felt you were fair and the things that were required were to benefit the tenant, exactly. and it was, the, and they stressed that you all were very thorough. So whoever did it, NRJP or whoever did the inspections, it was a very thorough process. Well, thank you. That's good to hear. And this is just a caveat that HUD required us to put in here regarding small area FMRs, fair market rents. This does not apply to Portsmouth. We are not a fair market area, you know, small fair market area, so it does not apply to us. So we're just defining in our policy. That, that PHA, this policy is saying that we will not um, use fair, uh, the small fair market rents in our, in our program. And that's all I have. Any questions? Keep up the great work. Thank you. All right. Great stand. Okay. Yeah, Any public questions? That was a lot of changes. Just we'll see why we have to do them as often as we have to. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Do we have any public speakers? Fill out the five minutes to speak. <laughs> there being none. This part of the beating is adjourned. Oh, you just you ready? Okay, okay, hold on. Mm -hmm. You got to be eating gavels and stuff. Next step. All right. So based on the comments that we received from the public, we'll um, make changes to the plan if needed. I'm going to ask that you approve it at your next board meeting, and then we're going to submit, submit the plan to HUD on May 17th. And then after that, HUD uh, will approve our plan. Approve our plan. Uh, we just let know that all the comments uh, will be in the plan. Yes, yeah, so any comments, the brothers from Citizens, the RAD board, <coughs> you all have to be included in our plan as well, and it will be. Yes. What necessitates a change to the agency plan? For instance, if we found a new revenue source or something that we wanted to change, what, what triggers having to make a physical or a actual change to the agency plan? Well, if you see in the agency plan, we've kind of broadened that. So as long as it meets the goals and the missions of our authority, we won't have to go through this every time. So we did make that change. So, um, and so that being said, we won't have to do an amendment every three months like we're doing mm -hmm. <laughs> now. So... Hopefully we'll be here maybe once, and if something doesn't fall within that area, maybe twice a year. <coughs> I don't see it more than that. Question. I have a question for Mr. Bland. Mr. Bland, you had sent me um, the notice concerning the public housing agency plan requirements for PHAs. And my only question was, the notice that you sent me was issued in 2001 and it expired in 2002. So I was wondering, did you have the most updated issuance of this circular? Normally what HUD does is, unless they send out a new one, that one stays in effect until they send out a new one. So that That's the consecration one has been around a long time. That's kind of... Yeah. That's kind of... 
you well, know. Well, remember, we, we are always subject to the HUD rules. Uh, no, but support. I'm just saying, if they issue the guidelines, because I'm used to that from mm -hmm. when I worked with federal government, mm -hmm. but normally they send out the updates, and for this one to say it expired, you know, I take that that it's expired, but there's been some subsequent issuance. And the other thing, too, the deconcentration is already in the ball of plate of the uh, annual plan to all housing authority. And when that when it's in there, the ho no housing authority has authority to change that word within their plan. No, I know that's why you sent it to Correct. me. But when I see the expiration right. date, mm -hmm. I have to question it because the normal person would say, okay, well, this one's expired. Where is the most updated circular? And so you're saying they just will expire it and not issue an updated one. It may somewhere in the future, but until they issue a new one, we're governed by the old one. So this one has been out of date since 2002, that's 17 years, and they have failed to issue an updated. I'm not going to say that they have failed. Uh, but you know for a fact you are not in receipt of it, is that correct? Only thing I can say, I know that for a fact that we are in, uh, we're under, we're following the guidelines that are given all housing authorities. Good, Commissioner. So my question is, in response to Commissioner Jiggis as well, is in that public information. So would you not be able to go on the HUD website so there are any addendums or updates? Would that not be available to mm -hmm. to yeah. any person? Right. If you, if well, you, my response to that, uh, Commissioner Chapman, is when our executive director mm -hmm. uh, sends me information to address my concern, mm -hmm. I am expecting to get the most updated information and for it to be an expired notice, it has to be questioned because I know how with federal government they issue all of these circulars, but we want to make sure that we haven't missed an updated circular on this for the last 17 years. So Mr. Blank can check on that just to make sure. I, I, I would, I would hope yes, he would. Just to make sure we have the current information, mm -hmm. Mr. Blank. And then you can resend that out to other commissioners. Any other public comments or questions? There being none, Chair, we motion to adjourn so we can go into actual session. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> Out the door. We gotta go do it. Okay, good. Meet okay. adjourn. All right. Then we're going back to the new one. All right. Um. Decided to read this again, huh? Yes, you did. <laughs> huh? Yes. Yes, I do. The Ports Redevelopment Housing Authority Perry J Board Commission meetings are held on third Thursday, Beach Monday at 5 p.m. All meetings are conducted at PRHA's main office. 3116 South Street, Port Virginia, 23707, unless otherwise noted. All members of the public are welcome to attend. Uh, Madam Secretary. All right, Commissioner Jiggets. Yes. Commissioner Lalonde. Here. Commissioner Morgan. Here. Commissioner Roberts. Here. Commissioner Washington. Vice Chair Chapman. Here. And Chair Smith. Here. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, before you have the minutes. Are any changes, any updates? There being none, Chase, you must approve any ratings. So moved. So moved. Second. Let's move to second. Madam All Secretary. All right. Commissioner Jiggett? Yes. Commissioner Lalonde? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Roberts? Yes. Vice Chair Chapman? Yes. And Chair Smith? Yes. All right. Old business, Mr. Bland. We got here. I don't have anything. To do. Have anything? Okay. Finance. We have anything? Well, we do have something. You know I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I'll be remiss if I wouldn't say I want to say happy birthday, birthday. <laughs> Shannon. Happy birthday. <laughs> we appreciate all you do. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to put you on blast with the public, but you're fabulous. So I'm gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> you're fabulous, okay. We'll stay right there with you. Yeah, they get it, get it. Yes, sir. From a finance committee standpoint, uh, Commissioner Roberts and I met with, uh, with Shannon uh, this this afternoon, and uh, again, as as uh, 
Our chairman just said tremendous job. Uh, a lot of uh, I appreciate the patience that the other commissioners had of trying to back off for the last month because uh, she has spent uh, Sunday evenings uh, here, uh, late afternoons to get the uh, get the audit get the information to the auditors, which they'll be. Uh, presenting to us in a couple months, next month, next month, so that'll be good. Uh, but some uh, some issues uh, uh, Mr. Bland uh, uh, presented to us that there may be some reductions in subsidies coming from HUD, uh, maybe, uh, but they've got to, we've got to look at the budget, see what the budget numbers are, but that's, uh, I just want to make folks aware that that's going to be something that we're going to have as the commissioners take a look at it and see what, what it may impact or uh, to the, uh, to the organization. Uh, they did. Uh, I, I am. I am very, very. I'm sitting on edge to get the uh, uh, briefing next month on the investments. Uh, there was a uh, a large uh, CD that was uh, negotiated for the month, and I and we do need to have some look at the investment policy and look at the procedures in place on who approves, where and how investments are made for this organization. Uh, cash flows, uh, we confirmed with Shannon, cash flows look good, accounts payables look good, accounts receivables look good. So, uh, again, another tremendous month by the Finance Department. Thank you very much for the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. Well, I do have to respond. Um, when it comes to financials, I like to have something to touch, to review, to feel, and not just get verbal information. I understand the auditors are here and everything, but at the end of the day, Without fiduciary responsibilities, we're best served if we have something in writing that we can review as individual commissioners. So noted. So noted. Uh, Commissioner Reed, you have anything? Good. Everything's fine. It's um, it's um, you know the it's not just the the auditors for the the housing authority, but it's the auditors for the various joint ventures and other mm -hmm. um, parts of the organization and so it is quite complicated but um, I'm confident in what we saw. Awesome. Great. Um, anything else? Next thing we're going to move on to is procurement. Not a thing. Not a thing. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. And now we have housing. Uh, one, one moment. <laughs> Uh, with procurement, um, when I was going through the correspondence from HUD, it indicated that once HUD had approved the Housing Authority's procurement policy, which they have, at that point, it, it was okay to have board commissioners to become a part of that procurement committee. And so, uh, Chairperson Smith, I would like uh, to see you consider that, appointing two members from our board to the procurement committee, because HUD has indicated in their correspondence that it can be done once HUD approved the procurement policy. And certainly, Mr. Bland can share that with you, the specifics as to what I was reading when he sent me that information. Okay, note taken. And it may have come from... Maybe, maybe came it. from uh, it. Assistant Executive Director Winston, and you can right. share it. Yes. Right. Thank you for that note. Take note well taken, uh, Commissioner <coughs> um, Morgan. Wanted to uh, make a comment on, on the particular request, um, and I hate to keep being a dead horse and bringing up what happened in the past, but I think it bears noting that part of what got the Housing Authority in trouble a few years ago was that they had board members on the procurement committee or procurement process. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they made recommendations that were not, I don't know if they weren't, a, they weren't appropriate, but they were not in keeping with HUD guidelines. Gotcha. And so I think that when everything, all the changes were made, it was a conscious decision to remove the board from that process. Yes, so at that time. Before we, before we add people back, I think it's prudent to ensure that we're following the HUD guidelines and because we're here to approve what the staff is work is doing, yes, sir. not my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. So, 
And let me respond. Gotcha. Was that not at the time when you were on the board too? Uh, it was after I was not on the board. Okay, then let me say. But we were. But we were. I will say that the particular issue that got on got us all in trouble. Um, I was on the board. I was not on the procurement part of that uh, issue. Okay. But it was uh, got us into trouble. Okay. Thank well, let you, me Commissioner. just respond. Hold on one second. Hold on one. Second. No, you hold on one second. Go ahead. The, the information with from the HUD review was not about a subcommittee. Their procurement falls under finance because it's a financial thing. So the financial we fall under when necessary, the financial subcommittee. The HUD review was in reference to board members on evaluation committees when we're doing solicitations. And in that <coughs> particular instance that got us in court and almost taken over by HUD, board members made up the majority of a, a majority of an evaluation committee. committee and they did not they vote they they did not follow almost every guideline that HUD has and that's why HUD uh, came in to review that particular solic that particular solicitation. They made us cancel the contract and resolicit and HUD had to review the process every step of the way up, up until final approval. And even after the board approved um, award, HUD would not um, allow that contract, this, this resolicited contract to go forward. So that's what the HUD, because um, you're talking about that audit that when HUD came in and, and um, I'm came talking out, about if, that, if that's what you, because that's what you sent her. You, Alisa sent you information about the closeout when the individuals, when as part of that hood fiasco, they the people came in from the um, the audit arm of hood, mm -hmm. and that's what. But that was all. That's what the the committee was. We don't have, and we never had a procurement um, subcommittee. And procurement falls under finance as far as when the committees were established. Procurement was put under the finance subcommittee. There is no separate procurement subcommittee. Then let me respond. Based on what I read, HUD gave the okay. Once they approved, <coughs> once they approved, they approved what you all submitted based on all of the problems that were going on. And in the directive from them by letter form, and you can pull it, at least when you get the chance, they indicate that because you all have met all of their requirements, that if if need, we are allowed to add board commissioners to that entity. And so I would say two things. Certainly pull it <coughs> for the next meeting. But they were not talking about me. the subcommittee. They were I'm talking about talking. evaluation committee. That whole... I'm still talking to the evaluation committees. <coughs> I'm still talking. But I was here present in the house when Hood came back and told us did their close out with us on that issue. I'm still I still so, the floor. So, but I do know what Hood told us. Okay, I still mm -hmm. have the floor and I'm going by what was in the written letter correspondence. And in the written letter correspondence, <coughs> we, as a board, because the Housing Authority met all of the requirements that HUD was requesting in terms of the procurement, I'll call it infractions or whatever. So at this point, we can place commissioners on whatever that entity is where the procurement is being reviewed. And based on that, um, Ms. Winston, if at the appropriate time, not this meeting, but if you would pull it, to share it with Mr. Bland and all of the board members. And let me res uh, okay. respond to you, Commissioner Morgan. Um, yes, there were problems before, but this is a new board. This is a new day. And this is a new time. And personally, I doubt seriously if this board will find itself in the position that the previous board did. 
And quite frankly, um, I, don't, I, I don't think it serves a positive purpose to continuously refer to what happened in the past on this. We are a new board, we got a new chairperson, new assistant chair, new appointees, and uh, we have to go through with a fresh start on everything. And you just you just made it so clear. You said it yourself. We have to we have to do that as a board. That's correct. We have to do that as a board. So you put it out there. It's no, out it's there. Not, no, that's that's true. Okay, let me talk. Yeah. You, that, like you said, you put it out there to the board. Mm -hmm. and, and you put it out there to the board. So now, just listening to the comments, I'm pretty sure, and I can't speak for them. No. But as a board, I'm pretty sure we ain't gonna touch that. Well, you can't speak for everybody. Yeah, I'm just telling. I'm just telling mm -hmm. you what I'm thinking. I'm pretty sure we probably won't revisit that. Just just through the experience of of the staff and the, the former board members that was here and, and what we went through. And B, by the way, we're doing actually a great job as a board. Well, would you like to put it to a formal vote no, now? No, you to put it to a formal vote. Since no. you're speaking on behalf mm -hmm. of everybody. No, I'm not speaking on behalf of everybody. Maybe you put words in my mouth. No, I can make, make the motion. motion. I mean, yeah. I can make you the motion. Go ahead, do it. Okay, I move that two commissioners from this board will join with employees, what I'm calling the procurement committee to evaluate future contracts. And I need a second. No second? <laughs> you said put it out there. Okay. Well, I, you yeah. wanted you yeah. to. Well, I did. Want you know what? I did. But you know what? And I, that is still my right to put it out there okay. again. Right. And maybe I have a second. All right. Yeah. So I appreciate you're not speaking for the board members and allowing it to be put forth mm -hmm. as a motion. So thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. I wanted to make a recommendation yes, that um, to provide Commissioner Jiggets with additional information that we table it and allow uh, Assistant Dep the Deputy to, uh, to provide that information that she provided to you so we can go over it all together to under get a greater understanding as to what it is that you're requiring or that you're looking for. Um, so that's that, what I'm just making a recommendation so that it'll give her time to pull up the information. Um, Miss uh, Allen, thank you. <laughs> also mm -hmm. to review it as well and so that we all can get a good <clears throat> understanding as to what it is that, that you're, you're seeing. Well, actually, that okay. is the way I wanted to proceed. Okay. But when Chairman Smith, right, you know, took the stance to speak on behalf of the board, right. That's why I went into okay. a motion. Okay. I was really wanted to go along with what you just recommended. Okay. Okay. And certainly, I still embrace that. Okay. Because if the other board members haven't read it, haven't right. seen it, right? Uh, certainly, you would want to see that. Okay. Because it's important in terms of how we go forward, what we can do. Okay. And so we can get away from saying, well, the old board got in trouble for this. And like I said, we're a new board. But you can't be ignorant mm -hmm. to what is going to be in the best interest of this operation. Understood. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And to follow that just one yes, step sir. further and to, to, to support uh, uh, Commissioner Jiggins, the committees that we set up, you know, finance, development, uh, housing, uh, personnel, we all have an element of procurement within them. So anything that's ever been pushed up towards the board has been vetted by those committees. And uh, I think Commissioner Jiggis, as she gets involved in the committees, mm -hmm. it's just going to naturally lend itself to two things. One, finance, and two, procurement. Because all of them, all of us speak it. It's, uh, uh, if we, you know, and, and I, I would rather divide and conquer like that mm -hmm. than have to sit a couple of us to review every every single procurement. It needs to come up with the endorsement of the as we do with finances, we do with housing. It needs to come up with our our endorsement on it, and I think it has. And uh, I, I, I encourage that we get uh, Commissioner Jiggis involved as quickly as possible in these committees because there's a lot of education this staff gives us, and a lot of questions that could be answered before we come here. So, thank you. Who take it? Anything else? Ms. Jingle. Housing. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have enough here. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. We can't do that. Okay. We are doing our write-offs. 
Okay, we are requesting approval to write off 10 delinquent accounts, totaling $7,139. Of this amount, $5,038 is in rent, $31 in excess utilities, and $2,069 in miscellaneous charges, which are due from the former residents who have not lived in the authority's low assisted housing for a period of the last four months or who are deceased. The amount of rent to be written off represents less than 1% of the total rent posted during the last four months. As a result of the staff's strict enforcement of lease provisions, 30% of the amount written off resulted from three lease terminations for unpaid rent, and six accounts resulted from voluntary move-outs and one accounted from debt. Since January 1st, 2019, the staff has collected a total of $4,102 for assisted housing development in which $3,809 came in from in-house collections and $293 is from set-off debts. The writing off of these accounts receivables will no way preclude our continued efforts to collect money owed to the authority. Did you want to take them both together, David, or? Uh, Ms. Lamb, you want to tell them uh, what procedure you have in place, all the write off Yes, I have a question. But we'll see you have in place all of them going right off. Mm -hmm. We'll see you have in place. I will. Did you want them to go together, David, or? Mm -hmm. And then we can go over them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, one's it two. Yeah, they're two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Separate. Yeah. Oh. He said you yeah, know. I have a question. When I, when I, because you sent this information to us, so when mm -hmm. I got it, I was trying to understand what is the method of payment that you all accept from your residents? Okay, we, money order. Money order. Check. Cashier's check, or they can go online. Does HUD require that we must accept checks? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand how Why we, we got into, cash? I'm trying to understand how we end up with these charge-offs, these write-offs. Right -off. You know. People don't pay rent when they move out. Is that the basically it? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But it's not like they're on for one month. It's like they seem to be on because for it's two a process. and three months. We have um, three unlawful detainers, then we can file a, well, a rent for them to execute eviction. So it's not that if you just don't pay this month, we put you out the next month. It's a legal process that we must follow. And that allows them to accrue exactly. unpaid rents. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. along with legal fees, late fees, um, which are considered miscellaneous charges. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're correct. Well, what about the, um, is there a percentage that ends up because of return checks? We That's don't get really... A lot of, we don't get a lot of return checks, and um, normally with these write-offs, it's for people that are non-payment, that are under lease Any termination, so. And so are they basically working the system, would you say? They know, they know they're gonna disappear, and they know they get three months of, I'm sort of hearing that they get three months before we take action legally. Well, we file every month. We file on lawful detainer every time they're late. Every time. But, right. So, for instance, when Attorney James filed this month, mm -hmm. they may not go to court until the end of May. Well, May's rent has rolled around again for the first. Well, they haven't filed, haven't paid for May's rent. So, when we mm -hmm. file in May, it's not going to go to court until June. But we're also carrying that balance from April and May into June. And so you're saying there's really no process to get around it? It's one well, of the you know, represent, the remember too, this is only, this is less than 1% of what we got, and there's just no way, I don't care what organization we got, there's no way we're gonna get 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we I, I am, I am, we've, this is, I think this is the third time or fourth time that we've reviewed this with the, with the uh, housing folks, the housing committee has, mm -hmm. and I've been very impressed on one, not only protecting the interests of PRHA, but also protecting the interests of the tenants that's there, because they have their rights. You know, the eviction, the issues on evictions, you know, we walk that fine line, you know, on how, how aggressive we want to be. So when you're, when you're only talking 10 cases in six months, all right, that, that's significant. I mean, they're in court, they're going after state tax write-offs. I mean, the behind the scenes that the staff is doing is absolutely amazing. As I said, with the with, on the finance side, you know, on the account receivable, you know, there's the double check there on both of them. So, while while I hate seeing anything written, you're seeing a write-off. You're seeing a, a raw number of seven thousand dollars. This is not stopped. 
Right. They still are going after this right. money. And if you read the significant right. activities report, you'll see that they did were able to collect three thousand dollars of the money that's there. But we have to take a snapshot. We have to clean the books. And at this point, we've got to say, hey, we've got to get off this off the books. And and I don't know what the number is, but there is X amount of dollars that comes in afterwards. So you know, <laughs> it's mean, it's a it's a double edged sword that uh, we, want yeah, to protect, we, we want to protect that. our tenant. We want to protect our tenants. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. Uh, when you say gaming the system. There is no way they're gaming the system because they, they had income qualifications before they came in. Let and, me I'm, and I'm not sure if we took each one of them individually, there's something happened, all right, economically. Well, I, you know what, we, can't, we cannot assume that. I'm only going by what the process is for eviction. And I'm holding it up to the light because my next question is, and I don't know the answer until I ask the question. Are the, te the tenants are not required to place a security deposit? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, they are. So does, is this net of having taken the security Correct. deposit? Yes, security deposit, yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, and on to any debt that's old when they move out. Mm -hmm. Okay. On average, what is the amount of the security deposit? It in varies, one month? It is it two months? Rent security? is based off of 30% of their adjusted gross income. Mm -hmm. We have some residents paying $0. We have some residents paying $900. So, so if you're paying zero dollar, you don't pay a security deposit. Fifty dollars, minimum rent. Fifty dollars. Yes, ma'am. So it varies. Okay. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. You want me to go to the next one, or you want? Mm -hmm. Take care of this and let you go to the next one. Okay. Um, Commissioners, for you have resolution um twenty nineteen dash sixteen resolution writing off. Un uncollectible resident account receivable assisted housing. Chairs need a motion. A motion, a motion to uh, accept uh, resolution involving the writing off of uncollectible accounts uh, receivables for assisted housing in the amount of seven thousand one hundred thirty-nine dollars and sixty-two cents. Second. The motion and proper second. Thank you, Commissioner. Madam Secretary. All right, Commissioner Jiggins. No. Commissioner Lalandi? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Roberts? Yes. Vice Chair Chapman? Yes. And Chair Smith? Yes. Okay. Right. Going to public housing. Okay. We are requesting approval to write off 14 units of accounts totaling $10,459.05. Of this amount, $6,434 in rent, $67 in excess utilities, and $3,958 is in miscellaneous charges, which are due from former residents who have not lived in the authority of low rent public housing for a period of at least four months or who are deceased. The amount of rent to be written off represents less than 1% of the total rent posted during the last four months. As a result of the staff's strict enforcement of lease provisions, 57% of the amount written resulted in eight lease terminations for unpaid rent one move out for serious lease violation, and the remaining five from five voluntary move outs. Since January 1st, 2019, staff has collected a total of $5,254 for the public housing development, in which $3,110 is for in-house collection, $2,145 is for set off debt claims. The writing off of these accounts receivables will no way preclude our continued efforts to collect monies owed to the agency. Question. Yes. When a tenant <coughs> leaves mm -hmm. our residence mm -hmm. owing, mm -hmm. does that preclude them from being able to go to any other city and participate in public housing? In public housing? Yes. We, Even Section 8 vouchers, everything. We, it's a system called debt owed that's in PIT, which is through HUD. Uh -huh. So we go in and we put that amount after the security deposit is taken. So say, for instance, if they were going to Chesapeake to apply mm -hmm. and their name came up on the waiver, when they go in the system to see if they owe any debt, it will pop up. So it does. And at that point, using your example, if they go to Chesapeake mm -hmm. and they're trying to rent there mm -hmm. and they still want to rent there, is it Chesapeake Housing Authority responsibility to collect what is still owed to us they to clear tell, out? They'll tell that applicant that they have to make good here. Mm -hmm. And once they do that, then we'll send something letting them know that it's paid in full. Okay. And have we been able to effectively use that system Absolutely. to collect? Absolutely. That, that system's a nationwide system. Okay. It's, 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 it's HUD. 
Okay. It's, a, it's a HUD system. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I just have one small correction. Um, in the, the little chart, the $67 for utilities didn't come down, but it is included in the total. Oh, on public housing? Oh, I mean public housing, yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Commissioners, let's still remember to do the uh, request to speak so we can do it the proper way. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Mm, I forgot Anything else, commissioners? Yes, I, I just, just want to compliment uh, Westbury. Uh, if you notice on the chart, there is no no uh, uncollectibles from Westbury. So the team at Westbury, uh, I thought they did a fantastic job. And given all the turmoil that we're having out at Lincoln Park, to only have three hundred twenty-two dollars in write-offs, I think it's pretty gosh darn significant. So to the management team at Westbury, the management team at Lincoln Park, just want to say thank you very much for a tremendous job, given the chaos they're going through. Uh, Chairs, need a motion. Any other a motion to uh, uh, accept uh, resolution uh, 20 1915 to write off, uh, I guess ten thousand four hundred fifty nine dollars eighty five cents of uh, uncollectible uh, resident accounts receivables public housing. Thank you, Second. Commissioner Lande and Commissioner Roberts. Madam Secretary. All right, Commissioner Jiggins. No. Commissioner Lande. Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Roberts? Yes. Vice Chair Chapman? Yes. And Chair Smith? Yes. And just, if I can, Chair, please. Yes. Explain my no. I, I just think we're writing it off too soon. That's mm -hmm. my personal opinion. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next item of business is development. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Close session, got it. Human resources, we don't have anything. Reports, mark significant activities. The plan. Uh, commission, in your, in your board package, you had the significant uh, activity report. <clears throat> I don't know if you had a chance to look at it yet, but um, if not, um, if you go through it and if you have any questions, you just give me a call back. I can get those answers for you. Uh, if you have any questions about the two significant activity report. If you just give me a call or send me an email and then on whatever your concerns are, I can get that information back to you. All right. Okay. You got any other comments, Mr. Bland? Um, you got remarks. It's on you now. Yeah. Commissioners, I, 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 I noticed that we, we kind of touched the board package three times. We emailed it to you. And then we send one in the mail, and then we're also preparing the book. You know, that's a little bit too much. So, um, I know we email them, and, and we send a hard, is it necessary to mail your copy if we're sending, if we're emailing it to you, and then we're also doing a, a book copy here. So, my, so the secretary, like she's like touching it three times. Are you, are you getting, I guess my question is, will the email suffice of your package, or do you want a hard copy? Because right now you're getting two hard copies. You get a mail and copy you get usually uh, on a Saturday. And then when you come to the board meeting, you're also getting another hard copy in the book. Well, I leave my hard copy here. But for me personally, I appreciate getting the hard copy mm -hmm. in the mail. I mean, which is fine. Um, I mean, but maybe you can take it on an individual basis. Maybe some commissioners don't need it, mm -hmm. the hard copy, but maybe <laughs> some do. So that will cut down. Mm -hmm for you also if i'm if i might speak mr bland um what it is that basically we're asking is that to eliminate having the binders because it's, you have your your personal one that you receive via email you receive another one physically to your home so would it be enough to ask just the commissioners to bring their package that they received if there are any revisions or anything i will provide it but instead of just doing the board packet in the binder and you know it's just time consuming and mm -hmm. it seems like i get a lot of feedback from commissioners that it's you know well, uh, personally i like having the binder when i get here because i don't i don't bring what i receive in the mail mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. Uh, like I said, it may be a personal thing with individual commissioners. Mr. Mm -hmm. Jiggis, I like having the binder here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't take this with me, mm -hmm. but what I have at home, mm -hmm. I certainly uh, have that in a binder. But now I'm speaking for just commissioners. Okay. All right. 
I, I tend to agree with uh, Commissioner Jiggets. I like having the hard copy at home when mm -hmm. you mail it to me, mm -hmm. rather than, because I don't go through it on the computer, um, because that's what I actually read and make notes on. But then when I come, I, it's nice to have it in the bind. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we'll, we'll continue the present process. <laughs> okay. Um, the only other piece I have, I know that uh, I'm, I'm a, at the uh, Finance Committee this morning, I handed out a, just an information, uh, information piece, uh, take one and pass it down. And I want to just talk about this just a little bit. Um, because I know the, um, and I want to uh, thank, uh, I want to thank the commission that reference to trying to see what we can do as far as uh, looking at salaries, which we will look at that. But we had did, we did somewhat some uh, a brief preliminary, and uh, what you see in red is showing that our projections for um, you see what what we see in the HUD subsidy from July of 2018 to June the 30th of this year, and what we were getting in subsidy from July of um, this year to June the 30th of next year. So the red column is showing that that's a decrease we're going to receive there. So it's a decrease like $418,000. Okay. Along with um, our capital fund is going to 1.9, that we, that uh, going down to 1.9. In, in this fiscal year, we got 2.2, .2 and we, we got, we're going to get 1.9. So when you add those two numbers together, that's $700,000 uh, mm -hmm. in um, a decrease of, of funds different from uh, from uh, the official year going in July of this year going forward, mm -hmm. and then also you know when when you look at doing salaries and things like that, not that we we I guess what I'm saying to you is that until we put together what we call our preliminary budget, which the finance committee understands, we will have a preliminary budget for the board to look at in June. That's when we have better numbers and see where we are, because also when you do a um, uh, salary increase. You got all the benefits. You know, on you got the pension, which eight eight point five six an employee. We have to pay into that. Then we got the FICO tax seven point six five. Then we had the group life one point three one, which is the second the tax your second page. Then we had what we call the long, long term disability point seventy two. So then on top of that, there's another eighteen point two percent that goes on top of that. And I, I know that Commissioner Morgan, he, he wants us to be financial conscious. So we got to make sure uh, that whatever we do, and we will look at it as a staff, that if we can, and if, and if we can't, we will say that to you. This is not the time. Uh, because, you know, when you're looking at $700,000, this may not be the time. But we'll be putting something together, and then we can better look at it once we put all our numbers together for our, our budget year beginning July 1. Just a quick question. <clears throat> Will the subsidy or the expected subsidy from Lincoln Park be in, affected by the fact that we're converting to the, I'm not sure the terminology, but, yeah. but not, a, not public housing anymore? It, will they adjust that once the units start being torn down? Or? Uh, they, they probably not do an adjustment until, uh, I'm going to assume, I'm just rough guess, I think they probably will do that adjustment until probably July 1. Of 2020, and that's a rough guess. It's a possibility. Or they may go ahead and take out the units that we had taken down this time, and and do. And we will not know yet. Uh, and they may go ahead and take the first 70 some units out of the subsidy for Lincoln, uh, since uh, we have already submitted that they have approved it, and maybe they can just give us the other half. Uh, and we we should know it probably in a few more weeks in reference to that. And the other adjustments down pretty significantly. Is that based on? I know a lot of times the public housing, HUD makes its recommendations based on the overall financial health or what they determine the financial health of the authority being. Is that how they did this or are they looking at reserves of that particular entity or? Well, it, 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 it's, it's, our numbers that historically they have been submitted before <coughs> were not correct. Best, best answer I can give you at this time. And so we're looking at, based on uh, on what the number should be, this is what it will be. Uh, sure. This time, yeah. I have a question. Question, Jiggins. Uh, you said the numbers that were submitted <coughs> were not correct. Did that come up during the audit? Or when did that come up for these adjustments? 
of these projections here? No, these are just projections that the finance director and myself had, had looked at, stuff like that. We're just doing so some projections. Is, this is, these, these red numbers in red are what you perceive the adjustments will be. Uh, is that correct? A, and not factual. Pro, yeah, it's a different process. process. So the, the audit is something totally different. Uh huh. And then there is a process um, that you have to fill out using a utility um, expenses and consumption, mm -hmm. and along with a, a very sophisticated formula that HUD provides for each of the public housing entities. So that was something that was totally um, separate process away from the audit. So the auditors have nothing to do with that process there. Okay, so when I see uh, Seaboard, when I see Westbury being in the red, mm -hmm. the projection, and just in layman's term, tell me how you all arrived that the projections are going to decrease. And I'm assuming in terms of what HUD is going to be providing to you all? Right. We anticipate what HUD will provide. Okay, to us. why? Because prior, the way that the utility side was figured uh -huh. was based on um, those properties are actually a tenant paid utilities, mm -hmm. and they want you to provide actual costs that we pay. Cost allocation, okay. Right. And so it, in the past, had been being figured differently than what we were told that we needed to be doing it. So this was correcting the way that those were figured. Okay. When you were figuring it the previous way, was that based on what HUD had instructed you to do at that time? I don't and then know, it changed around. Went, it, it, it went back even prior to the prior people um, that were before myself and a different position in the director of budgets position. So, okay. and I, ha I, I have not been able to find any documentation. That's why we've been waiting. That's why we, why we say that it's tentative because our field office has not got back to us once we've submitted it to let us know if we needed to revise it. Okay. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Now, the one point nine on the capital fund, we, we have seen. That's what we're definitely going to get. That's not uh, uh, anticipated. We we have that's gotten the letter, uh, so we know what that is. That that's that one point nine. And why did that decrease from them from her? Uh, it well, decreased good. a little because of um, Lincoln Park, the occupancy of Lincoln because Park. Because of the Lincoln Park yeah, the, transition. Yeah, so, and then once we, you know, as the units come back online through the project base, then we'll catch up. Then you, you catch know, As we, you know, move families into those units. So it's going to take okay. a some time to catch up. You know, okay. So it's going to be a time in between when we're not going to give you the income with those units. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think all of you, uh, I sent you an email that came from uh, Commissioner Roberts in reference to, I um, want to thank you for it. She sent an email saying that it, it, was, it can help us to speed up our meetings. If you have any comments in reference to the minutes, get those to Alyssa, uh, and we can make those changes along, along the way. I'm trying to get that email. Can you, you send it out? Yeah, it's just, I just sent it to, you just sent it to, to Davey. Yeah, okay, it well, you didn't yeah. get to, I didn't, I didn't receive, you didn't copy the phone. No, it was just a minor suggestion. Individually, you got to send it to all the commissioners, baby. It was such a minor suggestion. But I mean, it's a good point. But you got to communicate it. All right. Always. 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 Oh, some, of the, um, cool. my, uh, some of the some of the the managers, along with uh, the asset director, Miss Bow, uh, we're going to be going to the uh, Portsmouth Police Department Citizen Academy. It Ooh. starts Monday, <laughs> April the twenty second, and it's normally to June to June the twenty second. I mean, I'm sorry, to uh, for eight weeks. And, you know, going to the Citizen Police Academy at 309 Columbus Street, we'll see some of the training police officers get for the next uh, uh, eight weeks uh, to give us a better understanding of what, what they're doing. Uh, so the manager that will be going from the community, since they have a lot of interaction with the police department, uh, myself and I will be going to that. And then after that, uh, uh, I'm going to, if any of the other staff want to go uh, later on, they have the opportunity. Along with that process, too, they have in place a part of the police academy, citizen academy, that uh, citizens can do a ride along with the police officers that they choose. Um, 
so I'm, I mean, I'm planning on doing a ride along just to see what it's like. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. Uh, I did have the opportunity to do the same thing when I was in uh, Champaign, Illinois. And it gives you a better perspective of, of what police officers have to do. It, it really is. Uh, so that's going to, and that is, yeah, that's, that's all I have. Yes, sir. Any other comments, commissioners? Yeah, I've just got uh, four or five. I know some of them I've already talked to Mr. Bland about. Uh, Trucks is having their anniversary, 100-year anniversary this year, and I would I would encourage Port Redevelopment House Authority to be, to be engaged with Trucks, and that's a, it's a very, very nice neighborhood, very historic neighborhood. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the action plan I saw that you put in there about money for security and safety. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, as we meet with the uh, city council, just want to make sure that we keep and pushing that Hey, we, we need help with security uh, and safety in our in our housing units, particularly as we still see in the paper all the time, Dale Holmes and Swanson mm -hmm. continue to, for a myriad of reasons, all right, but we have that responsibility to make sure our folks are safe. Uh, I talked to Mr. Bland. Now that we've dropped Effingham, which was 178 units, we're, we've actually, uh, you know, taken a, a, a hiatus with the, with the, Lincoln Park, as we shut down that 100, 178 units, uh, we're moving towards a rad, rad uh, mission. I, th I think it's a good time for, with the personnel committee, for the organization to take a step back and say, is the organization structured the way we need to go forward? Uh, because we did, you know, focus on public housing before. I think it needs to take a spotlight needs to be put on. Is the organization flexible enough? Is it responsive enough to now meet the needs of what we are now, which is going to be more rad oriented, more housing choice voucher oriented, all right, and where 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 we're deploying all our assets? Uh, on the uh, on the Citizen Academy, just just a comment there. I, I got a uh, just and I I applaud what we're doing there. Another one of those things that we need to be in partnership with the police and the public safety folks. But uh, I know I talked about uh, you know if we could look at raises salaries for the employees. On the other side, uh, I think there were some employees that were, were felt that uh, uh, they, did, they did not want to take their evening time to go to that Citizens Academy. So I know, Mr. Bland, you're, you're trying to keep your finger on the pulse here, but just be even more sensitive that sometimes folks don't want to go to training, all right? Uh, so for whatever, so, for, so just, just mindful of that. The significant activity report, I, I really crave that report. I mean, I really do. It really shows the great work that this that the organization does. And uh, I, I want to focus back to you, Mr. Bland. If there's anything we can get written that shows what you do, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I'm not here to supervise what you do on a daily basis, weekly, and a monthly basis. I'm here to be part of the success, all right? And, and uh, I just, if there's just some place written that shows, and if it could just be another add-on to the significant activities report. This is what you got accomplished. And as I've asked before, what are those two or three things that you're looking for us to help on? All right, uh, uh, we bring a lot to the table and I want to be a part of that success. And closing in that, uh, 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 when when are we as a committee going to evaluate the performance of the executive director? All right, that's all I have. That's a great question, Commissioner Rolando. Oh, uh, one of the items of uh, the uh, Portsmouth Housing Authority, we're going to be submitting a letter. Uh, we're going to put our name in the hat for MTW in June. Um, HUD, HUD is asking for housing authority who are interested in coming to MTW to have a letter submitted in June. So we plan to submit a letter uh, in June to become an MTW, for what MTW, is which is MTW. moving to work. I'm sorry, okay. moving to work. I'm so, these acronyms, <laughs> uh, I'm just over these acronyms. I'm over uh, them. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm uh, moving to work agency. <laughs> right now, there are 39 housing authorities on a national level that are MTW. And, and basically what they do is come up with cre creative ways to help to make families more responsible and self-sufficient, stuff like that. So I heard over the next few years, we're going to take in another a hundred housing authorities into the program, and so they'd be opening up letters of interest in June, which is very competitive. Um, you can be the best in the world, but there are no guarantees. Uh, they say that probably based on number of letters, they make you just do a lot of it wrong. Uh, so, but we plan to submit and see how we how we do. Is there opportunity there for PRHA to partner with another housing authority? 
on this, you have to do an individual, no partnership allowed. You want to show your best, the, the 39 that have been mm -hmm. before, we, we stood alone. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you know, you got to, you know, and you want to, you want to stand alone because you, you want to tell your story and, and, and yeah, no partnership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Londa. Any other questions or comments, Commissioner? Yeah, yes. But I'll defer it if it goes around the table like this. Uh, I, um, I'm, I um, am happy to hear about the move to work um, issue because our family self-sufficiency program has been so successful. I think that it puts us in a great position to be considered for that program. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Roberts. Commissioner Jiggins. Oh, uh, yes, I have a couple of comments. Um, I had gotten a question from um, someone who works in city government. Who's that and someone, ma'am? <laughs> we can't, I can't say who that is. Well, what I'm saying is, it's someone who lives in Mount Hermon. And they're interested, they were interested in knowing if the Housing Authority had a program that, uh, a grant program for the elderly to where they can renovate their homes. And I think it was under what was called the Home Funds Program. And I think, uh, Mr. Bland, when you responded, you said, you just said, no, we don't have a program. But my understanding is we had it before. And so I would like to, my comment is I would like to see us bring that back because we have uh, a number of elderly in the city of Portsmouth who are blessed to be in their own owner-occupied home. And they don't want to pursue the route of the reverse mortgage. But certainly, uh, if we can pursue those home funds or either if it's uh, where the CDBG money comes in, I think that was a, the home funds was a CDBG funded uh, grant program before. I think there should be an opportunity for us to assist our elderly who are on fixed incomes, but they are blessed enough to be in their own home, but they do need grant <coughs> assistance to do some repairs. So that is, that is my wish list. I want to see the Housing Authority uh, uh, look at that because we've done it before. It's not, it's not uncharted territory. This Housing Authority has done it before. That was when the Housing Authority were receiving. You want to explain that? Yes. Too. Please do. So um, up until maybe about three or four years ago, that we received funds from the city, mm -hmm. CDBG grant funds and home right. funds, and that allowed us to provide those opportunities to the seniors. We no longer get those funds from the senior. HUD does not give us those type of funds to do those activities. So unless the city was to reinstate those funds, we would not have a revenue source to do that. So it's not true that this, the city has some CDBG yes. money? Yes. And if we asked, they could consider us getting some of that money to re-initiate this program? It would have to be aligned with their priorities. I don't under, I'm not sure why we stopped receiving those funds. From However, the city? From the city. However, you know, of course, you know, they have their own priorities um, with the needs in the city. So. Um, the funds are there, we just don't get them any longer. And so we would have to hire staff person to monitor that program, inspector to go out and inspect the work. So, if you know, the city would have to be willing to give us those funds back in order to do that program. I do get calls daily about that program because well, people know that we used to have that program. And so I definitely see it as a need in the community. I, but we I, just don't have a revenue source to do that right now. Well, we have the revenue source. The it. city has yes. the money. Yes. And certainly, I think when we meet with the city, it is something that we need to put on our list. Um, because, you know, ask not, get not. And so, we've had this program. Um, you're getting calls. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to people about it. It speaks to the city of Portsmouth because everyone does not live in a residential community, like I said, they're in homes. No, the so. veterans have a program. I know that. And um, <coughs> certainly I think this is something we need to formally uh, request from the city again. If, in fact, they are the only ones who can let the CDBG money down to us to do the program again. Yes, they are uh, what they what you call an entitlement. Um, sure, the recipient. So the money yeah. goes directly to them. Sure. And then they funnel it out the way they see fit. Exactly, exactly. And I don't, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to 
play Monday morning quarterback, but I think um, our council being very sensitized, I, I, I don't see them not wanting to uh, allow this program to be reactivated. And so that, that is my, that is uh, my wish. And then the other thing, um, even though I did not, I was unable to make the state of the city address, my understanding that those residents who were able to attend was the feedback that they enjoyed it? Yes. Is it something that you think maybe for the next year, because you know it comes up annually, mm -hmm. that there might be some additional residents that might want to, I just want to know how they felt about it. They, they seem to really they enjoyed, enjoyed it. it. They yeah. Did. Well, that, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear right. that. And, and uh, uh, we also have the staff. Uh, yeah, which is great. Staff yeah, to yeah. Join and sit at that table. As well. Yeah, and that, and that's great. And you know, when I think about um, the the theme, smart city, wise choice, that applies to all of us, all of us. And it's good that we had them engaged in that. And so I think that probably is it for me. All right, thank you, Commissioner Jiggins. Any other commissioners, anything? I just wanted to say, and um, Lou, if for whatever reason we're unable to, um, which is a finance issue, I guess, um, as far as giving the raises for the employees that we would consider doing maybe an employee appreciation day or something in lieu of that, if for whatever reason we find ourselves in a situation that we're not able to, yeah. that we would do right. something for them. Correct. Um, and so if they work hard, and, and we should recognize them for being Thank you, Vice Chair. Any other commissions? All right, that being said, okay. Okay. Um, <coughs> what I have here some uh, following guidelines and recommendations. I'll provide it to assist with clarifying our board and staff inquiries. That's okay. <coughs> And these following guidelines are and the recommendations are provided to assist with clarifying, you know, board and staff inquiries. Because like you said, we know they got a lot on their, their hands. You know, doing the day-to-day -day operations, getting stuff ready for HUD, you know. You know, and, and, and not saying that, you know, there are no restrictions on board staff, you know, contact. It's just that we need some proper channels in place so we can get it done the proper way. Yeah. We're not going to the closed session yet. We still, still got. Okay. We got more stuff. Okay. Yeah. We're going to add some stuff now. And then also, uh, you all received uh, the Force Speed Development House Authority annual confidential confidentiality agreement. If you have not so, I need you, if, as a board member, if you have not so, we need to, we need to sign it, in, it. I almost said immediately. Immediately. <laughs> I'm signing like my grandma for a minute. Uh, but. The majority of all of us have signed this uh this this, this policy. So we one more we can continue to keep this ball rolling, but it's very important that we get this document done. Yeah. And you're saying, I don't know that that's the committee yet. Or is it have I already signed it? What's that? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a copy of all of them. And also um, we have uh, our committee's roles and responsibilities. Um, and uh, I apologize, Ms. Jiggins, we didn't inform you that you are on the, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I Commissioner Jiggins, on the housing committee. <laughs> apologize for that. You've been voluntold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm officially told after they had the meeting and yeah. I missed it. You know how ministry is, you're voluntold. <laughs> and see you sitting there trying to raise your hand and turn it and they'll pick you. Yeah, come on, sister, come on. Come okay. on. Uh -huh. 
And so I guess I'll be informed when yes, the meetings will. are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yes, yes ma'am, you will. Okay. Um, and the main committee we have is uh, just I'm gonna go through this real quick. The roles responsibilities. We have our executive search committee, which uh, it, it brings the search for a candidate pool for the candidate recommendation, or it uh, like searching for an executive director, and um, identifying interviewing some of the finalists based on a set criteria, identifying and prioritizing finalists, and making recommendations to the full board, conducting telephone and face-to-face -face interview of candidates. This committee will dissolve upon selection of executive director, and usually what we do is the chair and the vice chair interviews the person, and then after we get down to a certain process, down to our last candidates, we bring the full board and we do our interview as a board. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And then the finance committee, which, uh, which is, uh, which is ran by uh, Commissioner Londe, Commissioner Roberts. Finance, commission, uh, finance committee shall review and recommend the board and the approval of financial statements of the authority in the audit and control finance procedure, uh, procedures during and following the audit. The Finance Committee shall meet to review and evaluate recommendations for changes in the audit, control the finance procedures of the authority. And I just want to give you uh, both a hats off to a great job you're doing on that committee. Thank you so much for your service. Um, Development of Committee, which consists of myself, the Chair Davy Smith, and Commissioner C. Ross Morgan. Um, and by the way, Shannon runs the, was the chief financial officer of the finance with finance. Michael Pack is the director of development and capital fund. Developmental committee uh, shall review and recommend the board recommend to the board the approval of proposals uh, of the officers and staff of the authority for acquisition, disposition, rental, and single family construction, rehabilitation, maintenance, and management of the housing development and facilities of the authority. Then we have our human resource committee. Jean Thompson is our human resource officer uh, and. Uh, Who's on that board? We got Commissioner uh, Reuben Washington and Vice Chair uh, Sonia Chapman. Mm -hmm. We provide provide recommendations to the board for the review and the update of personnel related policies, procedures, including but not limited to employee handbook revisions, agency wire compensation <coughs> and benefit structures, and the insurance carrier related concerns. Then we have our housing committee with uh, Miss Miss Jenkins, Miss Val Jenkins, Director of Asset Management and uh, Ms. Carol Thomas, Director of HCV, uh, which is which is uh, on that board. We have Commissioner Mariam Jiggs and Commissioner Bruce Alande. They meet the third Thursday, uh, 4 p.m. Provide training to the commissioners regarding public housing and house choice voucher uh, HCV programs. To bring forth uh, to bring forth to bring forth resolutions regarding write-offs, uncollected debts, which we talked about today, and housing-related issues of policy changes. And those are the committee's roles and responsibilities of the committee's we are. Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Bland? And then you had one, we left one of the governor's Oh, committee. yes, and I left one off, mm -hmm. that we left off the list. The governor's committee, where myself, the chair, and uh, Commissioner Morgan sit on that rule that deals with the bylaws and regulations. Anything we're going to do with policy brings back us, and then we bring it back to the board. Along with myself and uh, our general counsel, Ms. Uh, Karen James and uh, our executive director, Mr. Mr. Bland. And those are our committee's roles and responsibilities. So if you can update that and yes, the governance. Mm -hmm. And yes. then for Human Resource Committee, just you just can you? just note meet as needed. Okay, meet as needed. Yes, uh -huh. ma'am. Yeah, we, we meet as needed. And also, uh, mm -hmm. had a chance to go to the, uh, the Legislative Narrow Conference, which was a great conference. As, as your chair right now, I'm sitting on a subcommittee for the Ethics Committee nationally. I sit on the subcommittee with the chair. Mr. Uh, George Guy of uh, Fort Wayne Housing Authority, and that's just putting us on a national level where you know we're being seen and we're we're in the mix. Good. So just to let you know that conference went very well, and I, I did send some information back to Mr. Bland. By the way, some PDFs I can download and make sure you, we all get copies of the information. What the changes and the things that are coming through legislative wise. Mm -hmm. and question. Yes, ma'am. What, what is the status of updating the bylaws? Um, the commissioners have added their feedback. I came on, I added my do? feedback. Where do we sign, stand on uh, getting this thing approved? It's a matter updated? of uh, getting back with the subcommittee. Yes. Um, and we haven't set up a date yet to, to, uh, to look at them again. And then from there, then the subcommittee will make a decision when they can get them out to the full board, for, then, for the, then come back to the full board for a vote up or down. So I would assume between now and before the 1st of July, probably the subcommittee will but get them out to the full board. Get them out to the full board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Commissioner okay. Jiggins. Um, that's all I have. Do we have any public speakers? Period. Chair allows up to five minutes to speak. 
There be none. Uh, we're going to take a. Uh, we we got to go into closed session. Didn't do a recess. Right. We're going to closed session. Okay, resolution. <coughs> All right. Resolution 2019-19, resolution of intent to meet and close meeting. Whereas the Virginia Freedom Mission Act provides that the Board of Commissioners can meet in a closed meeting for the discussion of consideration of disposition of publicly held real property, where a discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position and or negotiating strategy of the public body as set forth in section 2.2-371183 A3 of the Code of Virginia as amended. The matters for discussion are Seaboard Commons, 912 Douglas and Craddock Properties and 8, 818 County Street and 3910 Victory Boulevard. And therefore be it resolved that in compliance with the Virginia Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act and the above reference section of the code, the Board of Commission shall reconvene in a closed meeting on April 18, 2019 for the discussion of disposition of publicly held real property A3. Chair, the motion. Chair moved. Second. As we move to property second, Madam Secretary. All right. Commissioner Jiggets? Yes. Commissioner Lalonde? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Roberts? Yes. Vice Chair 